Thank you very much, Ness. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. My name's Jez, and I joined Open Heaven 25 years ago. And uh, I think there was about 12 people meeting in a scout hut, and um, there was definitely tambourines, and um, Rich Wilson had a ponytail. It's um, some great memories. But it's been amazing just um, being part of the journey of Open Heaven. And um, I, I was just reflecting on this a few weeks ago, I think when Brian and Phil were speaking, but what really drew me to Open Heaven back then was um, the sense of taking Jesus seriously. And um, I, I love that, and I still see that today, and I think um, that's something we've got to keep hold of. But also the sense of commitment to, to relationships and the desire to share life together and really go deep together. And that's what, what we're touching on today is really about how do we share our lives with one another, but also making space for others who are maybe looked uh, looked over, looked uh, looked upon in uh, in ways that they're not always included. So how do we create space for people at the table? So this series um, of At the Table, um, we're rediscovering uh, the centrality and importance and power of hospitality, the simple act of welcoming, inviting people into your home, around your table, and how central that was to Jesus and his mission. Um, a New Testament scholar said that in the, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus was either going to, or is at, or was leaving a meal. In Luke 50, uh, in Luke, there's 50 references to Jesus and food. In Matthew, there's 94 references. Sometimes Jesus preached to large, large crowds, but I think often it's, it's easy to overlook the number of times that Jesus is just hanging out in people's homes. And, and we've got to recapture that. Many historians argue that through the practice of hospitality, the gospel grew and spread so quickly. So from the group of disciples to within 300 years, Christianity had gone from being this small, tiny little, little bunch to being the dominant faith and worldview of the Roman Empire in 300 years. And historians argue that that was actually because of the culture of hospita hospitality and sharing lives and talking about this, this kingdom message uh, and rooting it in, in normal life, everyday life. So just turn to someone next to you, uh, just very quickly, just in pairs, say hi if you don't know them, um, and just I want you to talk about why, what's behind this hospitality word, why is it that Jesus went around sharing um, meals with people, what is it about hospitality that's so powerful, what do you think it is? If you want to come up with a definition as well, go for it for bonus points, but just, just very quickly, say hi, but what is it, let's just think about this word hospitality. What, what's behind it? What's, why is it so powerful? Make a three if you're not quite next to someone. Okay, I'm going to cut you a little short. Sorry if you're in, the, in mid flow. Just finish off those conversations. Thank you. Um, anyone want to share a few thoughts out? Any, any, any key words that come to mind around this word hospitality and what's really behind it? Why is it so powerful? Anyone want to shout something out or share a little? Yeah. 
Yeah, really good. Hopefully you can all hear that. So Joe's talking a bit about food is a sort of a way that it, it sort of just normalizes people, makes people feel very comfortable, and um, actually you can open up more in that environment often. So yeah, good. Anyone else got anything to just to add into that? Well, there's lots of conversations. Hopefully you were talking about this. <laughs> But I, I think, I mean, at its heart, it's about bringing people together. Uh, it's about creating space to listen to others and be understood and known. And we all have a really deep desire to belong and to be known, don't we? And you can't do that. You, you can't, there's no fast track to that. It takes time. And, and over a meal is, is just a great way of showing and demonstrating care and love. It's about being included. Um, so the Greek word for hospitality is philoxenia. Philo being the word of love, and xenia meaning the stranger or outsider or the refugee. So translated, hospitality means a friend to a stranger. So hospitality is first and foremost a heart position. It's about us leaning towards those on the edges, looking out for those who are maybe not included. Actions might follow, it might involve food, but not always. It's about a heart position. And um, as we look at Jesus' life, we constantly, constantly see Jesus inviting people closer to him and, effect, and, and naturally to the kingdom by, by product of that. Jesus was drawn to those on the edges, to those who had counted themselves out. And that's the essence of the gospel as well, isn't it? That we are far away from him, but he has invited us close. That's what we've just been spending some time in. It's this invitation to come to God's table. That's the essence of the gospel. That's what we're talking about today. In uh, Luke 5, verse 27, Jesus was questioned, which was a common question, came up again and again. Why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? I mean, this was seriously controversial of, in the day. Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus, uh, who was a tax collector and despised. He'd sold out his fellow Jewish countrymen, um, adding uh, extra fees onto the taxes. Jesus saw him up a tree and said, Zacchaeus, get down here. I'm coming to your house for dinner. You're loaded, I'm not. Um, the crowd were not happy. Uh, following the conversation and time with Jesus, Zacchaeus later stood up and said, Lord, here and now I give back half of my possessions, and if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'll pay them back four times. So this was a really shocking story for those people around at the time. But as, as Jesus ate and created time and space for Zacchaeus, his barriers went down. He experienced Jesus' welcome and kindness and there was, this, there was probably conviction going on. We don't know what the conversation was involving, but there was conviction. Uh, there was probably some nice wine and maybe some bread as well involved, possibly. But actually, in that process of conversation and a meal, a huge change happened in Zacchaeus, in his heart. And who's the equivalent for us in our culture? Who do we look down on? Uh, who do we maybe despise? Sarah said maybe Boris Johnson might even come to mind at the moment, possibly. But who else is on the edges of society? Who is, uh, who, who is looked um, over? Are there people you can think of in the circles that you have moved in the last week or two? Who comes to mind? And as you think of someone, Jesus is heading there to their house to eat right now. That's where Jesus is drawn to. Those people we struggle with that we find hard to create space for. So for Jesus, meals were a tangible expression of love and being included. New Testament scholars point out that Jesus' meals and hospitality provoked a radical shift in the society of the day. Hospitality was already really highly valued, but Jesus challenged the norms that instead of aiming hospitality upwards to gain favor with those above your station, instead Jesus aimed it downwards as a way to serve others. And I really love that description and that challenge of Jesus. The hospitality, it's, it's, it's different to entertaining. It's, uh, it's not showing off. It's not trying to gain favor. It's actually, it's just a reckless opening of your life to, to whoever it may be. One scholar said that Jesus got himself killed ultimately because he hung out and ate with the wrong people. So this is something we need to take note of. 
And uh, we're commanded to follow Jesus' example of showing hospitality. Thank you, Ness. There we go. Smooth. So we're, yes, we're encouraged and commanded to follow this example of Jesus. Romans 12, verse 13 says, practice hospitality or be eager to show hospitality. 1 Peter 4, verse 8 to 10 says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality one another without grumbling. Maybe a little nod to the introverts out there. So this is a really uh, challenging Message, it's very ordinary. Meals are something we do daily. But how do we create space and share our lives beyond just those who maybe we feel very comfortable with and, um, and stretch ourselves as Jesus has shown us? So I'm going to hand over to Sarah. She's going to share some thoughts and some examples as well. Uh, oh, <clears throat> fabulous. I'm a little bit nervous. It's a bit nerve-wracking talking in church, so it is. Even though like, I talk to people all the time when I lecture, or I talk at people all the time when I lecture. Anyway, I'm also a bit nervous because this is a topic that so many people in our community take really, really seriously. I am going to share some of Jez and mine stories, but there's so many stories, um, like better stories, um, that people around this room have. That uh, So I feel a bit of a, like, semi a fraud, but semi not really. But anyway, um, you know what? And so, as I said, it is something that we really do take seriously as a community. So, a couple of weeks ago, we were at Dirk and Jules's house for lunch, and there was the great, the good, and the whoever at this lunch that we had at Dirk and Jules. There was famous people. There was not very many famous people. There was kids with all came in all shapes and sizes. There was people from all sorts of different backgrounds, and they just opened up the doors and invited literally whoever was walking past on the street into their house. And they really have just got such an open heart and an open space to invite people. People in. I think of the Whites, you know, there aren't many students in open heaven that haven't been round the Whites house for dinner. You know, I am praying that one day, if hopefully my children go to university, that there's a Whites family waiting for them, welcoming them in, uh, you know, that to love them, to parent them while they're at university. So, you know, just incredible thing that those um, guys are doing. And, you know, just there could be lo lots and lots of stories of lots of different people around the room and apologies if we don't get to hear them all. But I am just so inspired by what people in our community are up to. So a couple of bits and bobs from us. Um, I'm not sharing them because they're anything spectacular, but they might just be a little bit creative. So in 2005, about a year after we got married, we got bored looking at each other and wanted to invite other people into our lives. So in 2005, we got a friend called Bex Horton, and she was starting to work with um, asylum seeking, asylum seeker, uh, unaccompanied asylum seekers. And she had really noticed that one of the, she was doing a youth project. And one of the things that was the biggest challenge for these young people was where they were living and their, their living situation. And she was really heartbroken by what was going on because she could do all of this nice stuff during the day, but they were going back to these not very great spaces. So she was playing around with ideas of how that could be different. And we said, look, we'll take somebody to live with us for 12 weeks. Let's give it a go. Let's see what happens. And um, I think it was the spring. My dates are a little bit hazy. I think it was the spring of um, 2005. We welcomed a Kurdish boy called Dana into our house to live with us for 12 weeks. And as I look back, even though we've done lots and lots of different things over the years, that was probably the most special thing I think I've ever done. Like I've ever done. Um, you know, we've done loads of other things, but even, I, we, I only ever saw him once again after he moved out, and dear knows where he is now, but that was one of the most um, special things I felt we ever did. Not long after that, um, Open Heaven was going to be receiving a DNR, and a DNR is a bit like a, a modern day uh, intern. So we were going to be receiving an intern from another um, church to come and work with us for a year. Jez headed up the, de the, the program at the time, so he was looking for somewhere for this person to live. Couldn't find anywhere, and eventually I relented, and I was like, all right, fine, then come and live with us, it's okay, sure, we'll just get on with it 
And lo and behold, in, I also get really emotional when I talk in church. I don't get emotional when I talk anywhere else, but I get emotional <laughs> when I talk in church. Just a bit of an FYI. Um, so lo and behold, in the autumn, I think it was the autumn of 2005, Miss Gwendolyn Forster moved in with us. Uh, so I get emotional. It's ridiculous. I get emotional when I see her normally. Anyway, as if we really didn't actually want her to live with us because, you know, it was just going to be a bit awkward because Jez was going to be our boss. But she's ended up being one of the most important people that we know, important people in our lives. So woo, there we go. Um, not long after Gwen moved in, sorry. I'm not usually, well, no, I am usually a bit like this, so it's okay. Uh, not long after Gwen moved in, Bex had really got momentum with what she was doing with this work with unaccompanied asylum seekers. And um, she started a charity called Baca, and we said, we'll give it another go. It seemed to work all right with Dana. We'll give it another go of inviting somebody else to come and live with us. So we had another guy come and live with us called Solomon. And he ended up living with us for about six years and went on to, you know, go to university, graduate from university, and is now doing some fantastic things. Fast forward a couple of years, we bought a house with the Wakeleys and Louise because they had a similar desire to us. And over a period of about four years, we ended up living with around 20 different people, children, adults, people with their stuff together, people not with their stuff together, people on the fringes, people in the, in the, you know, the centre, just a, bit, a real mixed bag of absolutely everybody. Um, and we just had a, fun, you know, a fantastic time. Um, in about 2013, 2014, we had moved out of living in that fantastic house in Beacon Road. We had a little bit of time on our own and started our family and did that sort of thing. But we felt another nudge from God to um, take another risk and ask someone we knew who was a single mom with her two children. That's me getting emotional again. It's terrible. Ah, uh, to come and live with us again. So in 2015, Steph, Corey, Lily Faith, Antil and the dog um, all moved in with us um, with our three-year-old at the time and a nine-month baby. I mean, who thought that was a good idea? But it was. It was a fantastic idea. And in two weeks' time, this is extra emotional, we're going to be celebrating Steph's um, wedding with her and her family in Cardiff. So that's, I hope it's not a surprise. Um, so, you know, we just, we, they, those guys lived with us for a couple of years, became part of our family, and have gone on to do some fabulous things. Um, so those four little stories, those people were, were actual strangers to us. You know, we'd never met um, Gwen, we'd never met Dana, we'd never met Solomon, but we were kind of like, let's just see what happens. What's the worst that can happen? You know, let's just give it a go. Like, literally, the, there were some things that, that didn't necessarily go quite according to plan during all of that, but um, we just decided to give it a go. And all of those people have made impressions on our lives. All of those people have... Actually, we've, we've got more back than we've um, given during that time. Um, so, yeah, they sound, I, I also don't want to give a false impression, they sound like fantastic stories. They sound like, you know, there's weddings involved, there's university graduations involved. They sound fantastic, like fantastic stories. But it, that isn't the day-to-day -day reality, of course. It'd be naive to assume that it was um, all cupcakes and flowers. You know, there were really, really hard times. Um, you know, there was at least one person that was definitely a bit light-fingered with our community purse at Beacon Road. You know, there were some item money that went missing during that period of time. But, you know, it's only money at the end of the day. We'd, we had one person that lived with us in our current house that definitely had a different expectations of life and lifestyle to us, you know, and there was some tricky conversations that had to be had. Um, living with other people's children is really, you know, living with your own children's hard enough, never mind living with other people's children. And, you know, that was the feedback Steph gave to me anyway, you know. Um, so, you know, there are definitely like really hard moments in that, but our overall experience has been that we have been really blessed to have these people, have such a wide range of people as part of our lives. Um, but it's not easy, and I guess as you hear some of those stories, you think, oh, that's nice, but, you know, that, oh, that's all very well, but. 
And I just want you to turn to the person next to you and, and finish this sentence. So I'm uh, making the sentence up uh, as it, and I haven't got it in my notes. But basically, I want you to um, finish the sentence that says, that's all very well for them, but I can't do that because. What's the because at the end of that sentence? Turn to the person next to you. What's your because? Okay, hopefully there's some, some becauses at the end of there, or maybe hopefully not. Maybe you're somebody who's locked and loaded and ready for action. For me, there's tons of things for me that come at the end of that because. I'm really, really busy. I've got two kids, I've got a full-time job. I'm really busy. I, d I don't have any space. Um, another because for me is like things are just crazy in our house. I mean, they're crazy for the because we've got you know kids living with us, but they're they're just it's just crazy. For some people, it might be my space isn't quite right, or I'm up for it, but the other people I live with are, aren't up for it, or I'm processing some stuff at the minute. And and for some of you, that is really important, and you do need to create that space and and give yourself that space to do that. So the, I think there's loads of becauses at the end of that sentence, and that's where I think we can get really creative. It doesn't, um, you don't have to open yourself up and open your space up, open your time up. Just in your household, you can go to other spaces and you know, kind of bring life and bring love into those other spaces. So I know that Sarah Ford and a number of people in church um, regularly used to go and visit this elderly gentleman in his house. You know, they, they went to him and they, they kind of sat at his table and created, created space at his table. So, you know, you can, you can create spaces in other places. It doesn't necessarily have to be within your home. It can be, you know, making commitments to go out of your way uh, to welcome people in at work or, you know, what, whatever creative um, way. There's lots and lots of creative ways that can deal with the end of that sentence that because sentence. But some of it is about us being interrupted and um, you know, challenging our routines and seeing where those um, spaces um, are that we can create. And I think an awful lot of those becauses melt away when we realize we've been invited to the greatest table of them all. So we have been invited to the best banquet in the most lavish mansion by the king of all kings. We have been accepted at the richest, most loving table that has ever been created. And God has created space for us at his, at his table. And I think some of those becauses creep in because we forget or don't fully accept that invitation or that level of acceptance. We are, we are completely accepted at his table, no matter what baggage we bring, no matter how we screwed up that week, no matter how tired we are, no matter how busy we are, frazzled we are, you know, all of those things that might hold us back 
from inviting other people to our table, he just sweeps away. He just says, come, come, come and have, you know, come and be with me, come and dine with me, come and sit in my presence, come and get topped up again. You know, that is, Ness read out the a verse about the, the banquet, the bride, um, the wedding banquet that we've all been invited to. And that's the ultimate kind of space that God is asking us um, to create and replicate. So I, um, I really, yeah, I absolutely believe that those because those, those barriers that come up melt away when we encounter that acceptance, um, you know, on a, on a really deep, deep level. You know, our shortcomings, other people's shortcomings, they all pale into insignificance when we know that we are loved and accepted by Jesus. So that's what we want to do when we go into communion just now. We're going to go into a time of communion where we can just pause and sit at this banquet table and receive from God, receive his acceptance, receive his um, encounter. And we're going to do a couple of things in the midst of this, and then I'll hand over to Ness. But on your table, you've all got a small paper plate. So um, this represents the the plate at this banquet but in a slightly different way this is um what is on your plate right now what is on your plate what are you carrying right now what is on here that is a barrier that it could it could encapsulate tons and tons of different things so what are the barriers between you and god at the moment what um what is holding you back at the moment uh, what do you need healing for at the moment? This is just what are you carrying at the minute? What is on your plate? And so what I want us to do is everybody to grab one of these in a second and just write out to God everything that's on your plate at the minute. And then what we're going to do, we're going to maybe rejig some of the furniture in a second. But um, what you'll find on these banquet tables that we've got um, set around the room is a new plate, and it's a bigger plate um, on purpose because it symbolizes God's love, God's provision, God's acceptance being bigger than anything else that's on our plate. And we're going to fill these plates with rich things. We're going to fill these plates with things from God, with provision from God. So we are going to do communion. We've got bread and grape juice um, on the tables already, but we're going to bring out some other bits that just symbolize some of God's richness, some of his fullness, some of his, uh, you know, um, yeah, well, fullness. So we're going to bring out pl plates of fruit, dates, olives, hummus, cheese, just like really, really rich food um, that will be nothing like the banquet that we actually uh, receive in heaven, but a glimpse of that richness that God has to give to us, of the overwhelming reach of his love, of his, you know, acceptance beyond our wildest dreams or beyond our wildest imagination. Um, and we're going to fill our plates and we're going to sit and eat with God. Don't know if you've ever done that, ever practiced that in your house, just sitting with some lovely, luscious things and eat and talk to God. Encounter him. Tell him what's going on. Tell him what's on your plate. Share your story with God over a meal. Because that's what we're talking about as we talk about hospitality. It's sharing our stories over a plate with other people. And we need to be able to do that with God before we do that with other people. So I'm going to ask you to fill up your little plate. You can sit at one of the tables or you can take yourself off. You can lie down on the ground. You can sit up. You can write stuff down. You can do whatever you want to do. But this is five minutes to sit and eat with God and really talk to him um, as a friend. We've also got little verses on the table, the tables to reflect on, to engage with um, as you do that. So, we're going to go for that. Is that all right? Um, Simon, do you want to start the music? And first things first, grab a plate, grab a pen, and start telling God what is on your plate at the minute.
Could I um, ask you to, when you just finish writing your, the bits on your plate, whether we could just stand together. I just want to want to pray, and then we can dive into the communion. But just hold your plates. Um, if you're able to stand, you might not have finished scribbling yet. But so these plates represent some of the struggles, some of the things that we're finding hard, some of the ways maybe we've messed up, and we're disappointed in ourselves. But. Um, just thinking about that story of Zacchaeus, who was sort of hiding, really. He was up the tree, but he, he didn't want to get too close to Jesus. I think he probably felt shame. There was a sense of, I'm, I'm intrigued by this man, Jesus, but I, I don't think I can get too close. But Jesus saw him, and he came straight towards him. And that's what I want to share. That's what I want us to remember. Why don't we just close our eyes, and I'll, and I'll just pray. Jesus, thank you that you see us. Even with the stuff we're carrying, the stuff that's going on in our hearts, in our heads, you see us and you call us. You invite us in. You invite us closer. You invite us to your kingdom, to your table, to your banquet. And right now, as we just exchange some of the stuff we're carrying for this offer, this invitation in front of us to step forward, I pray, God, that you would help us uh, have the courage to respond, to, to meet you, Jesus, afresh. Maybe where we're feeling tired or maybe where you're feeling a bit distant, Jesus, that this next little bit of time would be a space just to encounter you, to know your invitation, that you have called us and uh, that you love us. Thank you, Jesus. So why don't you, there's four tables. This is probably a bit more on your own space at the moment, I think. Um, just come and get a plate, put some food on it. And um, if you want to find a space, you want to lie down, you want to kneel, you want to go and sit down, just a bit of space just to, to respond to God. Just for anybody that's gluten-free, we've got gluten-free bread um, up at the front. It's all grape juice. I'm a bit, I uh, haven't done the health and safety register on food allergies, so be appropriate with, uh, there's no nuts, but there is hummus, which has sesame seed, tapenade, or whatever it is. So just go for it. Um, but as I said, taste and see. Enjoy the richness. Delve into it. Get into it. Go for it.